I think black tie, white noise, it refers to uh, a very obvious, uh, the racial boundaries that have been put up in, in most of the Western world. It also has a lot to do with uh, the black and white side of one's thinking. I think it goes a little further than just the simplicity of um, a racial situation. White noise itself is something that, you, that I first encountered on a synthesizer many years ago. There's black noise and white noise, and I, I thought so much of what is said and done by the whites is white noise, so I thought I'd latch onto that. Black ties is because, for me, musically, the one thing that really turned me on to wanting to be a musician and wanting to write was uh, black music, Little Richard, John Coltrane. For me, for ever since a child, I mean, the uh, first artist I really sort of uh, dug was uh, Little Richard when I was about eight years old. I found it very exciting, this feeling of aggression that was coming through on the arrangements, particularly. And it was like breaking up the sky. His voice broke up the sky. It was an extraordinary voice. And, and it made me sort of really get interested in black music, which led me to blues, John Lee Hooker and, and all those guys. And for a number of years, I worked with rhythm and blues bands. So for me, I think, you know, one of the foundations of my interest and also my participation in music has been my own black ties. There's no revolution without violence. It's not a soft solution, but there is a positive outcome but it won't be gained easily and it won't be gained by singing We Are The World and it won't be gained by We Shall Overcome. Those elements of coming together should be foremost in our minds, but it's not going to be like that. It's going to be an awful lot of agonies to go through before there's any real move forward. I try and fill an album right to the hole in the middle with interesting and voluptuous new ideas. I don't care a tick for its uh, commercial viability. I don't think there's really been an album that hasn't owed an awful lot to uh, rhythm and blues music. Uh, everything that I've done has had that as a basis. It seems to be a consistent with me. As I say, it's a general awareness of black and white issues all the way around, the doppelganger effect of oneself, the two personalities that one can have, the inside voice and the outside voice, the voice that the world hears and the voice that you speak to yourself with. It's all those issues, duplicity. And there's so many areas of duplicity where it's very hard to see right and wrong as well. I think that one of the major differences in the way that we're working this time, possibly because we're older, is that the sessions and the things that we do talk about are a lot more informed by our personal lives this time around than they were the last time around. In the early 80s, I think we were more sort of hip to... Uh, sounds were very much almost uh, the entire substance of our life and the music itself. I think in the 10 years subsequently, one's sort of grown and matured a bit more and one's personal life starts to mean a lot more to oneself. And I think those things come up. That starts being reflected in the music. With any song, what you require from the solo player, unless you're a complete control freak, is you want somebody to interpret what they're hearing in their own way. And that gives the song a character of its own. And that's where it really becomes a collaboration. That's what each of these individuals did. They heard the song and they reinterpret it through their own instrument and that gives it its particular flavour. That'll set up the character of the song. That's all I required of them was to bring to it their own language. Lester Bowie, well, of course it had absolutely nothing to do with his surname. <laughs> had everything to do with his surname. It was his surname that made me go out and buy CDs. And what a pleasant surprise. He's got to be one of the major inheritors of the Miles Davis approach to playing. You have to follow him around the studio with a microphone because he won't stand still. He's absolutely wonderful. And he, he weaves great anecdotes as well of his early days in music. He has a brother, Joe Bowie, that I met in London in the 70s that I like very much indeed. But I needed a trumpet on this album, so um, Lester was an obvious. I couldn't resist it. The Bowie brothers. It had to be. Mick Ronson, of course, is the lead guitar player with the Spiders, my original band back in the early 70s. It's the first real time that we've worked together for in almost 20 years. It's a long, long time. We sort of kept track of each other through the years, though. Every time I go on tour, Mick turns up somewhere along the line and comes and guests on the show. And it was just uh, synchronistic that we happened to be in the same city at the same time. And I asked him if he would come for old time's sake and work on a, a song that we both liked very much. Uh, he said he'd be delighted to do that. He came along and played his usual breathtaking solos. Extraordinary man, extraordinary guitar player. There was one period where I toured for 10 years, eight or nine months a year, and I think I lost such a lot of my life through that. I don't think I'd ever let that happen again. And I've now come to an age where I really want to involve myself in my own life again, I want to take back my life and see some of it and live through some of it. 
everything that I do musically has to be something that I feel absolutely happy with artistically. That if I have a sense of uh, pleasure and fulfillment with it, then that is the work that I had intended doing in the first place. It's the texture of the song, for me, which almost comes above the lyrical content. It's not, I don't have great passionate things I want to say lyrically. The whole mass of sound becomes a texture and hopefully an ambience and, and a kind of atmosphere. I, wonder, I want music to create uh, an alternative or a, a counter atmosphere. It's the sexes in the rhythm. And being a very sexual person, that's very important for me, that it moves me. By using the vocabulary so many times of the alien or the outsider or the person on the periphery of events, I mean, really, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to make objective that which was in, incredibly subjective, actually. Mm. And it manifested itself through these sort of devices. My vocabulary was this sort of science fiction-y, alienated, isolationist, the isolationist, which, of course, is one soul. You know, and sort of every, all the events that surrounded and happened to that isolationist person were, in fact, the events of my own life. I think everything is a labyrinthine existence that we live, and so that it makes sense for me to put together elements in a song which wouldn't naturally be good bedfellows, pieces of information that don't naturally gel well with each other. Um, so I'll write on three or four different subject matters and then integrate them together by cutting them up and, and using that as a device for further stimulation. I know pretty much what the rhythm track should sound like, but once that, uh, that's accomplished, I really leave it up to the uh, top level uh, lead musicians to push themselves as far as they can. If you hear an accident three times, it's an arrangement. It takes on a different context entirely. If you hear it once, it's an accident. But if the same mistake happens three times, the mind tells you it's a road map to follow. But if I feel a little unsafe where I'm going, then I'm in going in the right direction. And if, I fe if I'm feeling comfortable with what I'm doing, something's wrong. For me, popular music doesn't uh, create any new values. It merely reflects the ones that society holds true at the time. The strong messages and the muscle of music in a social context is coming from Afro-American and Hispanic areas. And, and, and really, I guess the progenitor of all that was Marvin Gaye, who sort of really sort of put voice to feelings and, and expressed strong wishes of, of what he wanted his society to be like. That's why in music you have this, there, there, there's, there's some foundation to work on why one can develop very strong relationships with each other in, in music, is that there is the recognition of the common bond and this this, re this, this need to express oneself, which, uh, but then it's the values and the musical values particularly that one expresses oneself with that you start to really relate to each other. I, I, I never really saw the change uh, aspect of what I do quite as prominently as everybody else. I think more has been made of it because in a superficial manner the costumes have changed over the years, but I think uh, for me, there's always been a thread of uh, merely um, a search going on. And I'm not sure that there is an artist who's true to himself that doesn't search in his own way. Generally, I think the subject matter has always come back to the singular question of nearly every artist, which is, what's my relationship with the universe? What, whatever other form it takes, that's basic. I think that's probably the essential question that all of us ask ourselves.
Macrobiotic, a diet system inspired by the Zen sect of Japanese Buddhism. <laughs> 